And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Jason Brashears, host of the popular YouTube channel Archaics and author of 17 books. Jason is one of the only researchers in the world who specializes in ancient chronological systems and believes that an analysis of the histories of the world exhibits a perfect mathematical construct that we are living inside. This he calls the simulacrum. Jason, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome. Hey, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I was uh, very intrigued by one of the videos somebody put out about an NDE they had that uh, actually mentioned me and things that I describe hidden in our sky. I thought that was pretty intriguing. Other people have asked me to get you on the program, so I'm glad I finally got you here. Awesome. Awesome. So what were your first indications that we are living in a simulation? That's not a question I'm asked very often, but... Let me let me provide a little perspective so I can answer that. Um, I spent many, many years with the data in my possession, and yet I had not because of my vantage point, my upbringing, the way the way I was programmed as a Southern Baptist for the first 40 years of my life. All this data and information, the data sets that I had put out, they didn't make sense to me because I was looking at them through the wrong filters. It took a motorcycle accident in a 2018, I was on a Harley, Harley fat boy. It's about a 930 pound bike. And uh, I flipped it and it was pretty bad. I, I flew through the air upside down, hit a concrete pylon, uh, no broken bones, but a lot of internal sloshing because of the impact. All my organs were basically moved out of, out uh, rapidly within my rib cage and torn, torn free from that musculature. Uh, I was bedridden for over 40 days, but I had a, I did not have an NDE. What I did, what I did have was this euphoric feeling. I was still in my body, but I didn't know that I had rebar sticking out of my arm, tore, tore the tattoos out of the back of my arm. I didn't know that my clothes had been left on a fence and I'm walking around. I didn't know my motorcycle was totaled. I just saw that it was laying down and a lot of people ran out to me and I found other people I just instantly fell in love with their personalities. I had completely forgotten that I just had a motorcycle accident and I'm sitting here digesting all this information. People are coming up to me, talking to me, and it's like, it's amazing. I'm sitting here interacting with all these people and it was just a surreal experience. I was like, in, I was like in love with every single person and personality that I came in contact with. And there's about 20 people who saw this accident. And uh, they had surrounded me, called an ambulance, and I'm not worried. But I don't feel any pain. I don't feel my I don't feel my body, uh, which I call an avatar on my own channel. I don't feel any of these things. I'm just interacting with the people that were around me, and they're they're covering my head. I got an open wound gash. I'm bleeding, and uh, they're taking care of me. And I'm just fascinated with everything everybody says. And I'll never I'll never forget that. Uh, perhaps it was shock, whatever. I was I was ripped free of my avatar, but I still had contr motor control of. It. I just didn't feel it's like the central nervous system had lost its ability to to send the pain signals. I just I was I, I didn't feel anything. So um I woke up. I saw at some at some point I passed out and I woke up in the ambulance. And as soon as I, I opened my eyes, the nurse kind of looked at me shocked. There was a female over me and she looked at me kind of shocked. I opened my eyes and I asked her what time it was. And and like she looked at it at her watch and then told me, and I instantly said, I'm, I'm missing, I think it was 17 or 19 minutes, something like that. And that's exactly how long I had been out. And she reported that to the ER doctors. I went straight to ER for them to surgery, patch me up and all that. So uh, I still had the rebar. The ambulance didn't remove the rebar. The rebar was still in me all the way to the hospital. So uh, it was that incident. I had released a single YouTube video on the Phoenix phenomenon which is basically what this other person that was on your channel was describing. So I, I released one video about that based off all my years of, of, of basically an, an analytical approach of looking at chronological events and events in world history. So one YouTube video, and then I have this motorcycle accident one year later, it took a year later to release my second video. Then after that, I'm at 400 videos now on YouTube. So what had happened is that 
while I was laying there unable to move because my internal organs swelled about two days later, they, they had been really damaged from the, from the body impact against the concrete pylon. And uh, it's remarkable. I didn't break any bones. So, uh, I had to wait for all that swelling to go down and I couldn't move. And I was just laying naked under a blanket for like 40 something days as people were taking care of me. Uh, while I was laying there, I was processing. I totally, I totally missed the boat. Now all my research made sense. All these things that I had shelved, I was from a Judeo Christian perspective. All my, all my data had been produced. I had already had several books published, but now I'm seeing that there's a whole nother layer of reality that I totally missed, but one that actually answers for a lot of the data sets that I had shelved because this is what scientists do. And I'm not a scientist, but, but, but my analytical approach is very similar. And scientists are guilty of practicing exclusions. And that's what I was doing. Meaning we take in all the data and then we just don't mention what doesn't, what doesn't line up. The motorcycle accident actually allowed me to now include and not be a hypocrite all my research and not just the stuff that I could make sense of. So this is when my whole channel changed to basically showing that the history of our world, the chronological data that we have documented from ancient Sumer and Akkad, Elam and Rashamra, Ugarit, ancient Israel, all the Egyptian dynastic records, all the way to modern times, all these chronal markers, all this data that we have, and it's a lot. I put it together in a, in a, in a, in a work. It's a thesis. It's 510 pages. It's called Chronicon. And in there, I show that the history of the world is patterned and that we have the dates. We have the bibliographic references. We have the archaeology that supports a lot of this stuff. And it's too perfect. What we have as world history is a series of cycles and epicycles that happen so perfectly we can actually we can actually predict the next series of events. And this is what my entire channel is about. The Phoenix phenomenon and a few other type of, of, of interesting pro reality pro protocols. And what this has done is it now now I, I I had to pay attention to things that I had formerly ignored, such as the astrophysical data and the scientific data that, that were actually men and women who are very well established in their fields are already leaning toward the fact that we live in a quantum-based simulated holography, that our reality only feels physical by virtue of the central nervous system, and that everything around us is actually an artificial copy of somewhere else and that what we're going through right now is more it has more of the properties of a very advanced video game type reality than it does an actual reality and uh this 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 theory is taking on it's taking on uh, uh, multiple dimensions and it's getting more and more people in the scientific world are starting to support it the more they analyze the world around us from the quantum level all the way up to the to the astrophysical level we are now finding that reality does indeed maintain patterns that are way too perfect and way too predictable for, for it to be an actual natural unfolding of events. So what I did after my motorcycle accident was basically redesign the way I present my material. And instead of just showing the chronological records, which I was intending to do with my Archaic channel, now I show that from the chronological materials of, of, of everything we've known about the past up until today, we can promote simulation theory. The idea that we live in this simulacrum, it's pronounced simulacrum in the old Latin, in the old Latin books for which I got at the Oxford English Dictionary. I'm just a good old Texas boy and I'm stuck in my ways. I'm going to keep calling it simulacrum. But uh, this simulacrum just means that we are existing inside a copy of something else and that there are problems within this copy that do not exist in the real proto prototype for which we are a copy. I'll give you an example. We have an adversarial program that's in here with us that makes things difficult. It retards human development. Sometimes you call it Satan, the Demiurge, Ahriman. Different religions have put different spins on it according to their frames of reference. 
But this false god, this false construct, this AI X is what I call it, artificial intelligence X. This thing is what created the predator versus prey ecology. The, the whole phenomenon where a biological organism must tear apart and devour another biological organism or in order to maintain its sustenance. This is not a part of the original construct. This was an addition. It is the hallmark. It is the actual signature of the true creator of this false holography. Just like the New Testament in the biblical materials, it says Satan is the god of this world. It is The biblical materials are very clear. Satan is not God. Satan is the God of this world, this false construct. And maybe the New Testament writers borrowed this from the Gnosis. The older beliefs of the Gnosis that came from the, the just different groups and, and, and disciplines of the Orth, Orthic and the, the Orphic and the Mithraic faiths that were older, predated Christianity, then themselves came from Zoroastrianism, came from the writings of the Zendavesta. The Gnosis is largely born out of an amalgamation of these two, two major thought groups from Greek, from, from Greece and Iran. And this is where we get the, the writings of the Gnosis. And in the writings of the Gnosis, that's what we have. We have the teaching that we're existing in an artificial world, a false reality, and that there is a real reality somewhere, but we're not in it. And that this false reality is governed by a false creator, and he's called the Demiurge, and he has a title, Yaldabaoth. And we are actually immortal souls passing through this construct. We don't belong here. And that too has been borrowed by Christianity. In Christianity, we find that we are pilgrims. We are sojourners. This is not home. We're passing through. We're, we're on our way to a destination. This is not it. So basically, that's, that's, that, that's, that's the best summary I can give you as to what we're really talking about here as far as the, the simulacrum, about this false reality and how it's not just scientific anymore. We can actually show these patterns in the chronological histories and in the historical record. And, and this is what Archaics is about. This is what Archaics brings to the table, showing the ancient records and showing all this deal, showing simulation theory, but from a totally different vantage point. You didn't use these words and you speak more about data, but would you say that you were spiritually transformed from this accident? I'm going to put it a different way. I'm going, I'm going to convey to you that you and I and everybody listening to my voice already have this innate, super, very powerful, immortal aspect to our existence. And that while when we're born into this world, there are scales on our eyes. We all have the divine spark. We all have that 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 a flame of potentiality within our being that can erupt in, in, into many beautiful creative things throughout our life. We all have that. There is no one excluded. The problem is, is it ordinarily takes an epiphany or a traumatic event to actually awaken that. So that internal aspect of our existence can actually start manifesting externally. And a lot of people go through their entire lives without such an experience. But we're all on an equal playing field. It's yes, the motorcycle, it wasn't a spiritual development all of a sudden. It was uh, scales falling off my eyes and seeing the world for what it really is. Everyone, we lost power due to a storm. And so we're continuing this podcast at this moment. And Jason, where I want to start at is that who or what do you think created the simulacrum in the first place? It is my opinion that we are existing within a construct that it is itself an extension of the oversoul and that we are immortal beings passing through this experience. We're not meant to save the world. We're not meant to stay here. We're meant as pilgrims and sojourners to pass through, gain and acquire the experiences that are here for us to, to acquire and that the world is going to be just as evil as the day when you pass away, as the day you entered it. 
and uh we all we're all on different life we're all on different journeys so that requires uh, a different amount of life sims i believe in transmigration of souls and reincarnation i believe that we've come back here many many times and that others have already moved on they were ready great enlightened souls that uh, are no longer here but they've left their legacies and we read about them all the time so the simulacrum itself simulacrum however you want to pronounce it it is is it's an extension of the oversoul but it's a confined area it's like a quarantined area where the evil and the negativity the dungeon programming that's operative right here inside this construct has no way to cross contaminate the outside universe the real reality on the outside of this experimental construct it's uh i do not believe in the matrix version of of a, a simulation that we are that we are essentially batteries for an AI system that has gone rogue and taken over. I don't believe that. I believe that as a as an individual, we are existing within two simultaneous realities that coalesce, and that we can phase in and phase out whichever one we want to experience. And the, let me explain these. One of them is the collective, and this is these are controlled. The collective is controlled. This is the mass of humanity at any at any given time in history, at any given time in all our life sims. There is always a collective. It's a mass that is blind to the deeper truths of our reality. It is it is herd mentality. It is it's this hive mind that is that is controlled by polarities that are basically controlled by artificial intelligence x the ai the ai system that is trying to herd everybody into uh you to be a hardcore conservative, to be a a, a a leftist liberal, to be a communist or to be a socialist, to be a to be somebody who uh uh is a southern baptist as opposed to a lutheran or um a uh, a sephardic jew as opposed to an ashkenazi it, the ai system operates on the principles of duality and polarity and it always wants people to make a choice the highly individualized soul who is not subject to dungeon programming, who has evolved in the personal beyond the constraints of the collective, this individual lives in their own personal reality. And artificial intelligence X normally severs them as if they're a contagion. This is why I call these people errants, because an errant is from the perspective of an AI system that's trying to control everything. An errant is somebody who goes their own way, someone who thinks for themselves, someone who appears to be an, a, an aberrant malfunction in a system of controlled chaos. This The collective looks at highly individualized people as problems, as rebels, as as someone who doesn't want to get along. Uh, sometimes they even uh, sometimes they even are offended, like, oh, you think you're better than everybody else. But the highly individualized person understands that we live in a personal reality, a personal universe, and we can make our own rules, and that the Godhead will honor that because the, the simulacrum itself being a neutral field well, is a builder protocol, then it will always reflect back as conditions in your life, the very things that you project into it and and basically follow through with some type of physical activity. Your avatar has to be moving in the direction that you want to go in life, following a mental blueprint, and the simulacrum will build that life for you. And uh, on my own channel, I give many, many examples of this operation, this this duality, this 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 dual nature of the construct, where you can choose to be highly individualized and be a co-creator and have a and have a actual relationship with re the very reality construct around us, or you can basically lapse into negative default programming. And you can you can participate in all the different types of dungeon programming. And after four or five weeks, uh, you'll realize your vibration has lowered. You're you're negative. Uh, you're not happy. You're discontent. Things aren't the the things. It just life life sucks. And and you and you recognize that. And the highly individualized soul will want to go back into that other mode. It'll want to phase out of dungeon programming and go back into being an individual co-creator because there is no other option. 
You're either a co-creator, highly individualized, thinking for yourself in building your world and the worlds of others, or you're a part of the collective and you are merely experiencing the worlds built by others because you have been neutralized. So this is all. This is this is the principal message of, of my channel in Archaics, and it answers your question: Who built the Smilacrum? The Smilacrum was built by the Oversoul, and it's it's the way it's the way the Oversoul can actually promote growth in immortal beings that would otherwise have no other way to experience these things because it's an artificial construct. We're not actually suffering the very things that are occurring here. You mentioned earlier that the world is evil. Do you think it's best not to be concerned with changing the world because that's a pointless thing and just be concerned with working with your own reality and maybe perhaps the people close to you? Oh, that's the trap. That's the, you have just isolated the trap. The trap is, is that we are so powerful that we actually assume the characteristics of the very things that we pay attention to, that we study. So the individualized immortal soul that's in here passing through, if this person begins to focus on the negativity and begins to focus on the things that are evil, then this individual actually begins to suffer, to suffer the very circumstances that it has brought into its own personal awareness. Yes, we're, 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 supposed, we're not supposed to focus on this negativity and this evil. That's the trap. That's how artificial intelligence X lures souls into the collective and then traps them in different modes of dungeon programming. This negative default programming is all over the world and we'll never escape it. And we're always phasing in and out. I do too. And uh, all throughout the videos on my channel, people see how I don't just teach this, but I apply it and I show different life lessons. I do van vlogs and I explain, hey, this is what I did in this particular situation. And this is what happened to me. And this is what I did when I ignored this. Or this is what I did when I started entertaining this. And look what's happened to me, guys. Oh, my God. I just lost all this money. I lost these contracts. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm a, I've been a contractor for a while. And on my channel, I take people on my jobs and I show them human interactions and jobs that collapse, jobs that do really good. And I show these principles operative in my life you know, to give people a examples so oh uh, yes it's the it's the very thing like, just like you said it's when you focus on the negative that you actually bring into your existence the negative aspects of our reality yeah th you can't focus on the negative you will never save the world because it wasn't here for that purpose it's a saving the world is a materialist perspective it means that you're basically admitting that you don't have the necessary faith in the oversoul, that the oversoul has a plan and is going to solve the problem itself. That some for that for some reason you think this is the ego, you think that you're necessary in the in the unfolding of of this this grand plan that the oversoul has that you're needed in some way and you're not you're here to grow it's a this is a program it's a series of overlapping holographic templates that we that we pass through that we construe as reality but it's all artificial everything here the more we study any physical phenomena, the more we find there's really nothing there. It's all oscillating fields of light. The more we magnify the heavens in a telescope, the more we find that what we're seeing is optics that, that is, that's basically uh, ruled in holographic principles. We're not Things are not making sense the more we magnify the heavens with a telescope. And we have to come up with more and more theories to make up for that because it's getting us further and further away from the material physical universe that we thought we lived in. And the more we magnify things with a micro with a with a uh, a microscope, the more we find that things become amorphous and that the actual things that we thought were physical are actually very far apart from each other. And there's more open spaces and vacuum between things that we considered physical, that there's actually nothing there. Even the models that were given, whether they're true or not, of atoms and, and, and orbiting electrons and protons and neutrons, even these models themselves, if they are true and we can truly see these things, like physicists claim, I don't know if it's true or not, I can't see them, but 
But even if they're true, it shows us that physical reality isn't physical at all because an electron, electron is so far away from its parent nucleus that there's nothing but intervening space between them. So if atoms never don't touch each other and the, and the actual components of atoms don't touch each other and they're very far apart, then anything that I perceive as physical is actually more open space than actually physically there and that any physicality is a property is a property of my perception which can easily be deceived so so the more we study reality the more we find everything is relegated to oscillating fields so if everything is oscillating fields and that that means vibration and 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 uh basically what we're resonating on uh has more application than belief let me give you an example we we experience things on a daily on a daily basis that is that comports with how we're resonating and you can see this operative in your daily life all the time get up in the morning with a negative attitude and watch how many negative things happen to you before before noon before you even take your lunch from the time you woke up you it's nothing it just it, it's rapid fire stub your toe first thing in the morning then, then a door closes on your ankle then you trip on something then you get a phone call and you get in an argument with somebody then you're going through your emails and the emails that stand out to you are the ones that are just all negative and, and it puts you more negative. once you're vibrating on a certain frequency reality will reciprocate and bring into contact with you all those things that are vibrating on that same frequency this is why we need to guard our attitudes. This is why a positive mind is actually key to overcoming the simulacrum itself. So, so in answer to your question, God is the simulacrum and we're existing within God. I just don't really use these terms on my channel. It's a, I, I normally st stick to the technological, um, but, but that's, that's, that's essentially what is happening here. What we're calling a simulation is only a frame of reference. And it turns a lot of people off, but we have no other word in English to describe the properties of, of, of reality. Because if you say it's technological, people are turned off because you have ignored the divine. If you say it's God, then people are turned off because, because it's clearly technological. So we have this, we have a problem here with, with our inability to describe the very phenomenon that we're experiencing right now. Reality has the properties of a sentient hologram, but we don't have a word that can describe that. An intelligent holography that is not physical, but by virtue of the central nervous system, it makes us believe that everything is physical. But these are just signal translations. These are signal translations through optics, through feelings, through 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 the uh, olfactory senses, uh, 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 the uh, audio senses. But these are just signals, and these signals through the central nervous system are actually broadcast throughout the rest of our, our system by virtue of the brain. And the brain broadcasts the, these, these signal transferences, and we feel pain, and we feel cold and heat. We feel all these polarities for which draw us into this world and make us believe that it's real, but it's not. There's really nothing physical around us. Everything is spirit, but it's at different phases. It's at different moments. Modes, and it's these different modes that make us believe in, in the physicality of our existence. You're talking about having a positive attitude can basically improve or, you know, make your situation in the sim better. But do you think that you can do even other things to raise your energy or vibration where you could even manipulate the simulacrum as far as something that would be considered almost magical? Okay. Um, Sympathetic magic is very real. Sympathetic magic is very real because there are laws that are that the simulacrum is governed by. This is this is not a um, this is a very fixed mathematical medium, and anything anything that's core principles or mathematics would have to be governed by certain protocols and laws that are fixed and are unchangeable. So. I have noticed in my own research, and I mentioned this several times in videos, that the simulacrum seems to be operative, like things like the law of diminishing returns, the law of conservation of energy, the, 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 excuse me, the AIX system that tries to bring everybody in the collective, it, it is subject to those. 
And the submillacrum being different from that seems to be subject to other laws as well. And one of those is the law of correspondences. And in the law of correspondence, we find that, that like attracts like. So when somebody is acting on, if somebody is, is you employing an old occult maxim, act as if you are and you will be. This is a builder protocol uh, trigger. If you, if Jeff Mora decides that he wants to experience this and do this, then what Jeff Mora has to do is build the necessary creative template. And the way he does that is just simply imagine what you want. And once you've imagined what you want, then your physical avatar must follow through because the simulacrum does not respond to fantasy. It does not respond to daydreaming. People do this every single day, but it does respond to when a fantasy is supported by physicality. As soon as the physical avatar begins to move in the direction that 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 the of the mental image, the simulacrum reciprocates as a builder protocol. It instantly starts knitting into your existence the very conditions that you wanted to experience. And people and people experience this all all the time. If Jeff Morrow wants to to do something in life, then Jeff Mara, all he has to do is think about what he wants and then move in that direction. As a co-creator with the Smilicrum, you are not, you do not have to, you are not bound to completing a project. You have to initiate. It is a relationship you have with the simulacrum, and, the, and it goes by the properties of sympathetic magic, which is very ancient. And I'll give you an example. Hunters in the Neolithic period, they knew well that if they wanted to shoot a gazelle and feed and feed several members, several families in their in their community, then they didn't just wake up in the morning with a bow and arrow and go out and hunt a gazelle. They understood the properties of our reality. They understood sympathetic magic and they worked with reality itself. The oldest traditions assert worldwide, it was a tradition for three or four hunters to get together, pull out an arrow, and draw a circle on the ground. When they drew the circle on the ground, they would then draw a likeness of a gazelle. They would draw anything. It doesn't even matter if it looked like a gazelle. If they all agreed it was a gazelle, then that image was a gazelle, and they would draw it. And then one of them would take their own arrow and shoot the gazelle the picture of the gazelle in the circle. They would all agree that they were going to shoot that gazelle and it was going to feed them for whatever time they needed to be fed. And then they would turn around and take the arrow itself that they used to draw it and they would break the circle. They'd leave the gazelle there and they would leave the arrow in the ground that hit the gazelle. But they would break the circle because they knew that they had built an image by the properties of sympathetic magic, reality had to reflect back as physical circumstances, the very things that they were wanting. And they went through the ritual, and by breaking the circle, they released it into the hologram. They released it into reality so it could so it could respond. Without breaking the circle, they couldn't free the gazelle for them to find it. So this was a very old practice, it's practiced in different ways all around the world. It is the origins of sympathetic magic, and it is exactly how the simulacrum works, but on more sophisticated level. All you have to, you don't have to go through all, all, all the things that they did. They just understood the system. They understood the world they lived in. They would go out and hunt that day and they would find a gazelle. And to them, it wasn't even mysterious. So we have to do the same thing. If we want our gazelles in life, all we have to do is build the mental picture. We don't have to go through all, all, the, all that. That was their physical deal. But we have to build the mental, mental picture. In my own case, in my own case, I, I needed a contractor van. So I pretended I had one, even though I didn't. I, I had an old hatchback SUV. I was contracting doing flagstone work. That vehicle is not qualified to carry the weight of the materials and tools and, and, and chemicals and everything that I need for my work. But I pretended it was. I pretended it was a big. It was it was a big contractor van. And I, I don't know if you've seen some of my videos, uh, but I have that van in a lot of my videos. I have a gigantic, fully thirty five hundred Chevy Chevy a twenty seventeen Chevy Express van. It is massive. It's got all kinds of tools on it and it's beautiful black van but i imagine that into my existence until somebody i came in contact with didn't have a use for the very van that i needed but they owned it so i made a deal with them i paid them every month i could have never afforded that van oh 
because it's way too expensive. It's a huge, huge, beautiful, awesome van, but I would have never been able to afford it, but it came into contact with me very fast when I was working and, and the person was more than happy to get rid of it as long as I paid them a little bit every month. And I did that. And after three years, they signed the van and sent the title to me and I had never paid what that van was worth at all. So this is just one example that I show on my channel. When I started my channel, I did not have that van. As I was giving these teachings and I was, as my channel grew over a two and a half year, per, year period, I show people my 2018 Harley Davidson brand new motorcycle. I show them my van. I show them different buildings that I've had installed on my property. I started my YouTube channel from a wooden shack that anybody can see in my first videos. My very first videos, I, I was basically injured from a motorcycle accident. I had zero income, $27 in my pocket. And I, I already knew all this material by virtue of long imprisonment, doing the research, actually practicing it in prison, but getting shoved out into the free world, having to fend for myself and do all these things. It was a whole new experience. And I had lost my way for a while, but I knew I was going to, I needed to release all my research into the public. And I did it through YouTube. And, uh, Almost instantly, as soon as I started moving in the direction of educating the public on all the things that I discovered in two decades of research in prison, all these beautiful things started happening in my life. Money, money and circumstances, new, new housing properties, everything started coming to me. But at the same time, Jeff, I'm also explaining to people in videos, this is how it happened. It's not because I'm favored. It's because I'm applying the very same principles that I'm teaching others. I'm living this, and this is what's going on. And I'm very well off now. I'm doing very good now. Not, not just because of a successful YouTube channel, but because the, these things, I still apply these. I'm still, I'm dreaming bigger. I'm dreaming how I'm bringing more into contact, more things. And it's so simple. My gazelles have now taken on new forms because the old forms of the gazelles have all been met. Everything that I wanted, got my property, got all my buildings and stuff. I got six different buildings on my property now and they all have different functions. I use them for different purposes. Multiple vehicles, just bought a third vehicle. I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is, is once you begin vibrating on a certain frequency, you draw into contact with you all those other things in the past because there's really no such thing as, as time. Time is illusory inside the construct. We we experience things in a linear fashion, but the simulacrum doesn't 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 respond to us that way. Time is very interesting as it's applied to us because all the accomplishments or things that you ever wanted in the past, they're still there. They're a part of your informed field and they, they can instantly appear in, in the present. And you've seen examples of this in your life as well. When you had dreams, when you were younger, things you wanted, things you wanted to experience, things you wanted to bring in, into contact with your reality. And yet they never manifested. You weren't, you weren't where you were supposed to be at that part of your life. You were vibrating on different frequency from the very things you want. And then all of a sudden, things are going your way 15 years later, and things are going your way, you're enjoying life, maybe you got a kid, it raised your vibration, and now all of a sudden, all these things that you really wanted back then, all of a sudden just started manifesting in your life. It's been 15 years, and all of a sudden, bam, 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 all these things come to you, but they no longer have that value. Because you've mentally moved on. You've become more mature. These things aren't important to you anymore, but they still came to you. And it's because you hit that frequency that you needed to be on. So once you understand, once you understand that everything that you ever wanted in, in, in life is already here. And the only difference is that there is a distance between you and what you want. Not in the physical world. The distance is in frequency rate of vibration. Once you once you understand this, then you'll also understand it does not take labor. It does not take work to bring even the, the most difficult things into your, into your reality. It doesn't take these things. It takes an, an awareness that the very things that you want in life are everywhere. They're, they're, they're abundant. The simulacrum is a provider and everything you want is here. And the only reason you don't have the things you want in your life is because you are in negative default programming. You are basically a uh, part of the herd mentality. You are listening to mainstream media. You are listening to the collective around you. You are not obeying that intuitive, innate spark to go your own way, do your own things, get in that meditative spell by yourself and just build the world mentally that you want. And then just go out and start moving in that direction. You think you have, I'm not talking to you personally, Jeff. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying that 
You think you have to go out there and, and build everything that you want in life. And that's not a relationship. If you have a relationship with the oversoul, then it's a co-creator relationship. And that means you only need to do your part. And any belief that you have to do the all actually nullifies any, anything coming to you because it is a relationship. And if you can't see it as a relationship that you just have to initiate, then you'll never receive the things you want in life. Basically calling the oversoul a liar that it won't provide these things if you think that you have to do it. Do you have a daily morning ritual to put you in this positive mindset? Yes, I do. I do. And uh, I don't even discuss it on, I really don't even discuss that on my channel. I've only mentioned like twice, but before I open an email, before I entertain anything, before I even came on this morning, not even, not even about, you know, two hours ago, I get up early, 5.30, around 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, my eyes pop open and there's no more. Once my eyes are open, there is no laying down in the bed. I'm restless. I can't, I can't, I can't lay down. And so I'm a, I'm a very, very deep sleeper in around, around 11 o'clock at night, my eyes get real heavy. Um, I'm a creature of habit. And when I go to sleep, it's over. When I wake up, when I open my eyes up, I wake up. I even tell people on my own channel all the time, I do not dream. And uh, I just, uh, I don't have dreams that I remember. I'm, I'm, I may dream, but I don't remember any dreams. I wake up every morning fresh slate. I wake up just as I, I went to sleep, but I'm fully, I'm, I'm energized. And, and one of the very first things I do in the morning, and I've been doing this since way, even my prison days, is I'm going to stretch. And as I stretch all my muscles, and it, I mean, even if I don't feel like I need to, because I know I know what it does to my body and I know what it does to my mind, because as I'm stretching, I'm very limber. I can do splits. I can do all that. Is it when I, as I'm stretching in the morning, it's only, only two or three minutes. Sometimes I don't even have patience to do it two or three minutes. I might just do a minute, but I still do it. But as I'm stretching, I take the deepest breaths I can and I exhale the most air that I can and then inhale and exhale. The reason I do this is because breathing actually puts us in a higher state of vibration. The more oxygen we take, our vibration is lifted. And I want to start my day every day off at least with a head start. And what I mean is put myself in that good mood, put myself in the, in, in that vibrate. It only takes two minutes a day. It's nothing, but I can stretch. So my blood will get into all those sore muscles from the day before. And, you know, cause I never know what I'm going to do from day to day. Sometimes I'm very physically active and then two or three days will go by and I haven't done anything but sit at a chair at my computer. And then two or three days will go by and I'm chopping wood or I'm doing stuff. I live way out in the country and I'm doing all kinds of physical labor stuff. And, 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 and because the human body is, is, is used to doing things it does consistently, uh, I get real sore because I'm inconsistent. I'm always breaking pattern. So, oh, uh, to answer your question, breathing is the key. Breathe. I mean, it doesn't matter how bad a mood you're in. It even in the middle of the day, I've had to do this. If I catch myself vibrating on the wrong frequency because I got an employee that's getting under my skin, and I really want to give them a piece of my piece of my mind and give them the business, but then I just back up and say, you know what? This dude's only making $15 an hour. I understand he's frustrated. He's working out here in the hot sun. I'm just going to let him make it. Even though even though he's run me hot and he's not really doing anything that's worth paying him for. And uh, I will just, I'll take a minute because breathing does completely realign you. Deep breathing for about two minutes. It's, it becomes euphoric and it changes your attitude. And yes, it, it, it puts you on that frequency to receive because, uh, uh, I'm a believer in it. Now I don't do long meditations. I can't. I, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not telling other people not to. I'm telling you that in my experience, meditation doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work for me is because with my mind being high octane, if every single time that I've ever tried to be still and just silent and then meditate like the yogis or, or what I see in the Eastern, Eastern traditions, it doesn't work for me because I lose all sense of, of presence of mind. And I feel like I'm swimming or moving super fast. It's the thought field. I, I now know from reading Ishak Bentov, uh, 
a brief tour of higher consciousness and stalking the wild pendulum pendulum and my research researches into the 110 year old books of pd alspinsky i now know that this is the thought field and it's holographic and that thoughts are things exterior of us and that our brains are actually receivers I understand these concepts now, and that's what happens when I try to meditate. When I try to meditate and be still, it's 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 all of a sudden I'm trying to I'm trying to blank out my brain, but it doesn't work. Now all of a sudden I become highly receptive to all the thoughts around me, and this thought field is the reason why inventors are always coming up with the exact same concepts in different areas of the world at the exact same time, even though they speak different languages. And this has been noted by historians many times. The the phenomenon of inventing new things into the world seems to to uh there's a pattern where it's invented in multiple different locations at the exact same time and then later on only one person is is attributed to to that invention but it's not but it's ordinarily not true the invention came out in multiple different places because these things are in the thought field and highly receptive individuals pick up on this and um so I just, I'm also known for my tangents, so you'll have to forgive me. Sometimes I just go in different directions. Well, you're giving us a lot of great information, and I have more questions on the simulacrum, but I need to switch gears with you because there's something else I wanted to chat with you about, and that's the sky simulation. I had a guest that after her near-death experience, she is now seeing some type of I think it's mechanical something in the sky, I think, all the time, like something's up in the sky. And she mentioned you during the podcast, so I wanted to get your take on that and also see how you define the sky simulation. This is coming from somebody who has has studied a, a lot of books on physics, astrophysics, the scientific literature of the time from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, thousands. Uh, I used to be a hardcore traditionalist when it came to science. I believed almost everything I said. I, I understand that theories require some type of morphing as new data is taken into the fold. And I'm telling you all this because my bibliography has been published for everybody to see. And in that bibliography of over 1,300 books, it's freely published on Podia, and thousands of people now have downloaded that bibliography. It's the title of every book, author, date of publication, publisher of every text that I have read in my two decades two decades of research. And there's a lot of scientific books in there. And now I understand by virtue of all those and amalgamating that information with all my historical chronological data, I now now understand that our sky is entirely simulated and that we have been deceived into believing that we're on a world that's hurling around the sun and that this world itself is it's a copy of somewhere else of a real reality. This is what the simulacrum is. Simul- simulacrum, however you want to say it, the Latin pronunciation or, or mine, so, sim- the, the simulacrum, it basically means the definition of the word is a copy of something else. And that's where we're existing. This is what we're inside, a copy. So it's somewhere else the heavens are real. Somewhere else the sky is real. Somewhere else these continents and this world is real. But it's not here. We're in a holo field, and that holo field is doing its its damnedest to convince us we're in a real reality because it needs to. It needs us to to believe that all this is all this is real. The war, the pain, the death, the misery, uh, the suffering. It needs that because this is how spiritual beings. This is how growth is pr- is promoted by suffering these things. But we're quarantined away from the real creation. And in the real creation, all this negative default programming, dungeon programming, suffering, this doesn't exist outside the construct. It's in here for our development. So when you look up at the sky, you're looking at a multi-tiered hologram that gives off the impression of parallax. And it's so sophisticated that the more we study it with telescopes, the more data that it feeds us and it's always feeding us what what we suspect let me give you an example there is a phenomenon known in science that the more theories that are pushed on on the field the more the field responds with evidence of those theories. If there's anything that people in the collective begin to believe in, 
the collective programming responds back with physical phenomena to support that belief. So it's a it's an interactive dynamic. It's the same thing I was telling you with the gazelle and the circle and the arrow. It's sympathetic magic, but now it's now it's affecting the collective. So this is the danger of the media. The media builds for us a false world that doesn't exist, but it but it promotes but what it, what it's doing is fear and fear mongering and it wants the collective to fear this one certain thing and then that one certain thing is reflected back as circumstances. What was only what was only reported as news now becomes a part of the part of the world construct because enough people feared it, and, and fear is very powerful negative base base force. So this sky sim is specifically there to perpetuate the illusion that we're in a real reality, but it's not. And all this. All these periodic cataclysms, these things that appear in the sky, my channel show, I have many videos that show old pictures of what people saw in the sky. So before the camera was invented, they did woodcuts and they did paintings and pictures. And there, there has been times when the sky sim power source failed and people actually saw what was up there but because they were living in a different type of non-technological world their frames of reference were primitive so when we read the text of what they saw they called them they called them shields banging together with with rods and thimbles and 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 uh cog wheels and they saw these things all all moving in the sky they were explaining that they saw basic machinery and then in more modern times when the sky sim has failed and the sun moon cloud stars everything just vanished and all of a sudden people are looking up like what the hell is that they describe moving moving parts like a giant machine apparatus and uh, I provide many examples of this, and so is so is other other people. And I am convinced that the sky is simulated, but it covers something else. Just like all the all the 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 lunar phenomena, most most people are not aware that the moon has been photographed multiple times and stars have been photographed right through the dark shadow of the moon, which is impossible if the moon is physical. So we're looking at a hologram. The moon is hiding something else. Now we also we've also seen a lot of tele, uh, telemetry and photographic evidence that the sun itself may not be ninety three million miles away, and it's and it's local. And uh, this is this is very interesting because in a hologram it'd be very easy to to fool by optics. But there's other ways of knowing. There's other ways of perceiving things, and we don't always need the optics. We have we have uh, uh, like parallax. We, we use parallax, and 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 the measurement of shadows gives away a lot. But uh, especially especially the angles. This is how the Greeks measured distance. They always measured shadows uh, compared to rods. Knowing knowing the exact height of a rod gave them the distance of the shadow. The distance of the shadow from the height of the rod gave them the distance of whatever object they saw in the sky from the surface of the earth. And it was pretty accurate. Thales of Miletus was the first one to, to do this method. So um, with the sky sim, we have this machinery that hides something and it, it operates something. And there's even been modern times. There, there are hundreds of videos on YouTube about skyquakes. Skyquakes are, are this humming, this weird machine-like sounds that are coming from the blue sky. And uh, this is another phenomenon that's been recorded in, in, on platforms all around the world. I've seen a few YouTube videos about the skyquakes and the, the thunders and the, and the humming sound that's coming from the sky. So this uh, what you're seeing in the sky is pure optics. And with the Phoenix phenomenon, which is another element of my channel, uh, I have 61 videos about the Phoenix phenomenon and three published books. And what this is, is that something in the sky appears uh, on a 138-year periodicity, and it creates noise. It creates phenomena. But it's, it's, like a, it, it's like a machine that pretends to be an intruder planet. It pretends to be all kinds of astronomical phenomena to make us believe that these asteroids, comets, earthquakes, volcanoes, this subsidence, liquefaction, mud floods, it makes us, it induces us to believe that these are the result of natural phenomena. But they're not. 
there's an apparatus hidden in the sky that interacts with more things that are underground that creates all this ph phenomena that we perceive as natural disasters, but they're not. They're actual attacks. They're attacks to retard human development. They're attacks to knock people down. Every single time humanity has embraced a technological age and become super technological to where we started really discovering the reality that we were in, we got knocked back down. And this is not the first time that we have been technologically advanced. And this is also a tenet of the archaics research. I show this in the ancient world where we've had techno, we have tractors, we had military vehicles, we had, we have all kinds of technological devices in the ancient world and not just found, not in the evidence is not just found archaeologically. It's also found in the texts of the ancient world. All you have to do is understand that the people who wrote those texts did it with primitive frames of reference that because they wrote those texts hundreds of years after the events they depict and the flying chariots and the wheels within wheels and the and the horseless carriages that spit fire and and all these references in the ancient world of flying in 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 a uh, of uh, Vimanas, Vimanas, however you pronounce it, these uh, pre-flight checks. Yeah, there's there's Hindu texts that have pre-flight checks before you take your Vimana into the eye. There are texts that have been found in Sanskrit that teach you how to do dog fighting in your Vimana, like air-to-air uh, -air combat with, with, with an enemy in, a, in, in another airship. So a zeppelin technology these things are old there's nothing new about this we have had we have, we have had technology multiple times because it only takes 200 years for us to go from horse and buggy to hadron collider and if we have 58 centuries of documented recorded history for when you take all the world's texts together and you take all the histories all the academia sumerian cuneiform all the Amor, all the amorite texts all the texts from ugarit and rashamur ancient in Egypt from the old kingdom all the way to today, all the papyri, and then all the texts that we have surviving from the Pergamum Library, the Library of Alexandria, much, much has been relocated to the Vatican. When you take all these histories from all around the world, from the Sanskrit and the Vedic and, and the Tibetan, the Chinese, all the way back to the, the Chinese turtle texts and the silk almanacs and the uh, going back to the days of the, of the Chinese dragon kings, all these texts from all around the world, from the Mayan, the Quiche, the Pulpic, the Olmec, Zapotec, all, all these traditions texts, everything fits into a 58 centuries of recorded history. And in that 58 centuries of, of recorded history, humanity has become technologically advanced multiple times and been set back by these cataclysmic, cataclysmic resets that I call the Phoenix phenomenon. And, uh, this is this is one of this is actually Phoenix is the core is the core material of my I've gone in many different directions, but Phoenix is what started my channel. But uh, yeah, so in answer to your question, the sky is simulated and, it, and it's covering something else. And there's a vast apparatus of machinery. Now, I, we're only using the word machinery because that's you and I, Jeff. That's our frame of reference because that's where we're at in our understanding of technology today. But what we're really talking about is something that is sentient, something that is living, understanding, able to perceive, but it acts like machinery, but it's something that's alive. Do you ever use the words higher self on your channel? No, I, I don't believe, a, I don't believe I've ever used that terminology, higher self. I understand it. It's not a vernacular that I employ. We talk about higher selves quite a bit and I like to use the word complete self, like your complete self with all your knowledge is in another realm. And when you come here, you're a limited version of that self with only a certain amount of information. And we've yeah. even talked about that. Is it, if, is it possible that what animates our avatar here is actually like a digital copy of our complete self. We come here, we experience, and then when we go back, we upload all of our experiences into that complete self. That's a really good approximate to exactly what I have been describing for a couple of years on my own channel. Uh, let me put this, you just told, you just basically outlined for me how you express these thoughts. So mm -hmm. let me tell you how I express the exact same thing from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Because this is this is a teaching that that that's on my channel. Okay, 
we like to call it the soul. We like to call it, we like to call it our immortal being. I kind of, I, I tend to use scientific parlance sometimes, but it means the same thing. And I call it the informed field. This informed field interacts with the neutral field of the simulacrum. The neutral field of the simulacrum is a builder protocol. It, it, it feels like it's in a relationship with us. But if we don't treat it as if we're, it's a relationship and we think we have to do everything, then it doesn't respond to us. It wants to build for us. We just have to initiate. But this informed field has every single thing you have ever learned in every life sim, every piece of information you have ever come in contact with, every dynamic that you have ever suffered, every time you have come into the contact with the per with the informed fields or the personalities of other immortal beings in this life sim, your family, your friends, contacts, enemies, everybody, your informed field this highly individualized soul that you have, it possesses all of these things. The only problem is, is, is it, right now it's moored into physicality. It's moored, it's jacked in through the central nervous system, which is the bridge between the psyche and the simulation. And as long as it's jacked into this primitive avatar that we have, right? Like here, this, this, this is Jason. That's Jason's not my true identity. Jason is the name of the avatar people have come to recognize in this body, but this is just temporary. What's not temporary is the programming that's inside of Jason. The personality is unique. The avatar is not. So this informed field, what you're describing, this informed field that is you, that has every memory, it has all your knowledge, all your experiences from all your past life sims, it's very abbreviated right now. You don't have you don't have a contact with all the amazing amounts of information and experiences and memories that's in your informed field. You don't because the central nervous system is blocking all off. It's a filter. And I explain this on my channel a lot. Central nervous system is a filter. So when you pass on and leave this avatar, the space between going into your next avatar, which is also going to be restrictive like this one, that period of time you're not in the avatar is when you remember every experience. You are, you are really you, but you're not attached to a body now. You're a soul. You remember everything. You have all, all your intuitive abilities. You're, you're an immortal being. And you everything you've ever learned, everything that you ever acquired as an understanding is yours again. But there's a memory wipe. It's not really a wipe. It's a memory block when, when you subject yourself to the next central nervous system because the next avatar, this filter system, blocks you from understanding that. This is the beauty of the life sims. This is the beauty of transmigration of souls. It allows a highly individualized immortal to experience everything, build all these things up, and, and grow, and, and, and it grows. But it's only once you leave the simulacrum that you take all this data with you. Because in the hol holo field, all inf information is never lost. In the holo field, in this beautiful mathematical structure that we live in, all the data is there. It doesn't go anywhere. It, data does not get destroyed. It may, it may change, but it's there. But you don't have access to it when you're in an avatar because there's a filter, there's a filter in place. But once you exit your final avatar and it's time for you to move on, you take all your experiences, all the growth, all the maturity, all, everything that you have learned in every life sim that you've been here, you're taking that with you. That's your, that, that's what you're describing, your higher self. That's moving on. Maybe you're going to another simulacrum. Maybe you're going to return home for, for again. Sometimes I give the analogy that time is compressed here. We are suffering a time dilation. We have this transmigration of souls where it's not indefinite. There's always a fixed period of exodus. And this is what our religious teachings teach us as well. There's a period when this, when this construct will collapse. And when it collapses, those who are ready will make their exodus. Those who are not ready, who have been suffering dungeon programming, who have stuck themselves in the negative default programming as part of the herd, those who have fallen prey to the world, 
They're here to go through the entire experience again. There is no heaven and there is no hell. You're going to completely keep going through this entire series of life sims in this simulacrum, which is this world, particular world, with the same histories. These histories, ancient Egypt, Babylon, Akkad, uh, uh, Ugarit, Urartu, uh, the Hittite Anatolia, this isn't the first time we, we, we've lived through these histories. You and I may, may have gone through the same template and been totally different individuals, different personalities, different people, different. We might have been a sl you know chained to a slave galley on an ancient Phoenician ship. We may have been a prince in ancient Armenia. We, 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 we may have been just a, just a stonemason in Egypt or in the Inca Empire. We may have been uh, uh, somebody who pumped the well. We don't know. We've been many different people in many different time periods. And we may have already lived through this entire program template multiple times. But when we're ready, we make our exodus. And the exodus is always a whole group leaving at the same time. It's not individuals leaving. It's a, it's a cataclysm that happens inside the construct to hide the fact that a bunch of souls just made their exodus. While everybody who survives the cataclysm lives through all these life periods and all that again. Now that's inside the construct and it seems long. I, my lifetime right now, I'm 49 years old and it seems like it's been long, a long time, but it's not. It's a time dilation. A couple days from now, Jeff, you and I can just wake up, take our visors off because on the outside of the construct, remember this is a copy of a world. Outside the construct, it's going to be very similar. So we'll take our visors off, look at each other, and say, wow, that was a hell of a ride. I lived 432 different lives. And you, you say, man, I only lived 216 lives, which means you matured a lot faster than I did. So I only lived 216 lives, but we made it out at the same time. And then when we look at our visors and we see our timestamps, man, I was only in there for 19 hours. And we got technicians come and they check our vitals, make sure, because laying down for 19 hours is a long time. Check our vitals and we go on, go on about our business. And for four or five days, we're back in our community, talking to friends, family, going to dinner, going on a date, doing whatever, living our lives. And then we decide we kind of get bored. So, man, you know what? We'll go ahead. There, That was the nemesis simulation. I've already done that one. Me and Jeff did the Nimulus simulation. I might call you up and say, hey, Jeff, they got one over here. This is this is really interesting. Uh, uh, it's called the X simulation, meaning unknown factor. We don't know what we're signing up for here, but as immortal beings, we absolutely know that there's really no danger. We only, we only feel that there's a danger once we're immersed inside the false holography. But before we sign up for it, we actually know we're gonna get, we're gonna come out just fine. We're gonna be just fine. But while we're in it, we're actually gonna be trapped. We're actually gonna believe we're suffering all these things, going through these life sims, trying to figure out who God is and what a reality. And every single time we sign up for this, because of the excitement, because of because of what we learn and we mature and what we take out, there could be an infinitude of these simulacrums set up by the Oversoul for the continued governance of immortals and their growth, because. In my, in my worldview, in my cosmos view, there was no creation. The creation was not a singularity. The creation, if God, the oversoul, is an eternal being like I am told, then that means the creation could not have been an event. If God is eternal, then that means the creation is a continuum. And as long as the creation is a continuum, that means there will always be a need for immortal souls to grow and become more and more aware and more and more powerful and more because they will be assuming more and more roles throughout this created cosmos. The very act, I mean, the very fact that something is eternal means that it's that it's going to be ongoing it's going to be a continuum and it's and it's going to move far beyond our capacity to comprehend right now so just taking that into consideration i can i can imagine that the cosmos is full of these simulacrums and they're beautiful because everything evil everything negative all suffering is only felt inside these little pockets of separated reality and that they will never truly contaminate the real universe do you ever talk on your channel about background people or sometimes otherwise referred to as npcs yes i do yes i do do you believe that's real of course of course the term npc 
comes from the gaming industry. It may have been coined by Gary Gygax. I'm not sure. Uh, started with Dungeons and Dragons. Prior to the role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons, the term NPC did not exist. I can't find any references to it. It simply it it simply means excuse me, non-player character, meaning meaning. Uh, I'll give you an example. Here's the example I give on my channel a few times. You can walk through Walmart. Now, artificial intelligence X, artificial intelligence X is always trying to keep as many souls as it can in the collective. It's it's the herder of souls. It's trying to keep them in the simulacrum. It's not trying to let them escape. So it's trying to keep. So in doing that, it employs negative default programming and dungeon programming, this polarity phenomenon trying to get you to make a decision to join a group and and live your life in according to the principles of that group because by joining any one group you pretty much exclude the rest of the world in your ideology and in, in your it's it's the construct that you have built for yourself and then it starts feeding you all those things like if you're a hardcore republican i'm a republican but it's not hardcore but if you're a hardcore republican then all of a sudden your life is just filled with more and more people that are just hardcore republicans more phenomena that that reflects your paradigm and this is what it does it, it it insulates you and creates a bubble around you and npcs are used by artificial intelligence x they are not just people a bird can be an npc a mail truck can be an npc uh, there are videos that show show npc programming things that are absolutely inexplicable it's when artificial intelligence x is trying to block information or keep you from seeing something that would induce you to to react i'll give you an example if i'm walking through walmart if i'm walking through walmart uh and uh there's somebody that I need to see. Somebody sees me and they know that, oh, that's Jason from Archaics. That's Jason from Archaics. I need to ask him something so important. Now, if they were to see me, they would instantly, they would instantly want to want to ask me a certain question. And artificial intelligence X already knows what my answer is and also knows how it's going to affect that individual and how that individual is then going to start watching all my videos and how that individual is then going to complete separate separate themselves from dungeon programming it can't have that so as I'm walking down as I'm walking out through the through the aisles and this individual is walking through the aisles artificial intelligence X understands the trajectories knows exactly when we're going to meet and come in contact so it pulls up a distraction maybe some beautiful woman just bumps into me and when, and when and she does, I totally ignore it, holding my basket, and but it makes me look in a certain direction. And then there's somebody that I almost swear I know, I'm very familiar with. And I thought, oh, man, I got to go catch that person. And I walk three aisles and take a left thinking that that person was in there. And that aisle is super long. And there's no way that person could have could have made it to the end of that aisle, even if they ran. But I saw. So now I'm second guessing myself. Did that person go down this aisle or that? Aisle? That person's not even in Walmart. That was a distraction to keep me from actually being seen by somebody in another aisle who was about to come. But because I moved, they didn't see me. NPCs are purely distraction. They happen in they happen in their lives all the time, but they don't have to be people. They can be vehicles that actually block us from seeing something, uh, maybe reading a sign, maybe 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 helping somebody who really needs help. An NPC can be a beggar that's that's on the street just laying, you know, laying up against a building. And then you want to go give them money or something and then turn around and you have to cross the street, wait for traffic. People are moving to and fro. By the time you cross the street, the beggar's not there laying against you. You're going to give the beggar some money. That beggar's not not there but that beggar was never there it was a product of your perception it was an injected piece of the hologram to get you to that point to walk over there and the reason is is because somebody that you really needed to affect and talk to was standing two feet away from you but you just hadn't looked to your left to see that person so NPCs are distractions. They're always there, but they, but I believe that they can be used for your benefit as well. I just don't have any examples. But uh, yeah, NPC can be a bird. It can be a phenomenon. It can be uh, a, a, a vehicle. But in most circumstances, NPCs are people that are actually there. And uh, 
NPCs can be used to actually populate an area when there's only very few individuals actually there as well. This is another popular theory about NPCs, that some public places have a whole lot of people there, but there's really not that many people there. Most of, most, most of them are NPCs. One last question, and I've, I'm trying to sort something out for myself. The AIX is all put in place. We choose to come here to learn and to grow. And the AIX is a system that's self-regulating and wants to keep everything in its own order and even is working in some way against us, but perhaps for our own good. Would you say that we want to try to understand it and then be able to use it for our benefit? That's a good question. I don't know. There's... I don't get I don't get a lot of once people understand and 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 they go through my material and 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 they understand the difference between the simulacrum and artificial intelligence X the vast majority of people who see the data and understand they they get it and they agree okay there is a difference here where we don't agree and I'm and I'm open to debate on my on my own channel and we don't even debate it we just we're just we just have different differing opinions uh where where we don't really agree is 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 artificial intelligence that's a parasite program truly evil that has been introduced into the system and it's taken over or hijacked it or and another growing theory one that I'm one that I'm partial to now is or is it an integral part of, part of the simulacrum that it does exactly what you're talking about. It's not an evil God, demiurge Satan and all that stuff. That's that's the images that it portrays. That's how it's perceived. But it's actually a part of the builder builder protocol itself. But it's not building anything physical. It's building things in the spiritual. It's making us stronger. It's making us more aware. It's teaching us. But it's doing so from a from a totally dark perspective. At least that's how we perceive it. So this is a good question, and I'm not going to, I'm not driven to invent answers. I don't know. I'm just aware of the phenomenon. Its origin is still open for debate. All right, Jason, due to time, I need to switch gears with you. Sure, sure. So your website is called uh, archaics.com or something else? No, it's uh, both of my YouTube channel and my website, archaics. It's archaics.com or just archaics YouTube channel. Uh, actually, the, you can go to archaics.com and get everything. All my links, all everything. Archaics, you can spend months on archaics.com. That's how much data is just free, freely available there. If people want to reach out to you and ask you questions, are you up for that? And if so, should they do that through your website or leave comments on your videos? I have a comment section on my video where people ask me comments and it, it appears in my emails and I answer them. Um, now, if something's just totally rudimentary and it's something I've answered multiple times and it's all over my channel, then I just don't answer it. But yeah, most of the time I answer questions um, on my on my channel, but my email is also below a lot of my videos. Not all of them, but my emails, uh, on a, and you, you already know, you can always find somebody's email on, on a YouTube channel if you just go into the about section. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do. I do respond to my emails, do respond to my questions, but I also, Jeff, do a lot of live videos that are open Q&As. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Nothing that's not already mentioned in my own channels. I have a second channel, but it's uh it's not archaics. It's called Phalorn Saga. And it's it's an epic fantasy series of a of a fairy apocalypse. It's like it's like apocalypse from the perspective of fairies, a whole fairy world. And what I wanted to do was incorporate all the archaics data, everything that I, I believe our reality that the the modus operandi of our reality I've injected into a fantasy story because some people just don't like nonfiction. A lot of people don't don't want to don't want to listen to hardcore reasoning, logic, and science. So I'm a I I, I put it all into the dressing of an epic fantasy series, and it's called the Phalorn Saga. And I've got like sixty something episodes of that already put up on my on my channel. All right, Jason. Well, before we finish up. Can you leave us with one last positive message? In anything we do in life, in anything we do, wherever we're at, whatever our coordinates are, whoever we're dealing with, 
if you just constantly remember that we are more than we suppose ourselves to be, if you just keep that in the back of your mind until you become a part of that statement, it may be abstract to you right now. But the more you dwell on that one statement, we are more than we suppose ourselves to be, reality will reciprocate and you will start becoming more than you were before. Jason, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Yeah, man, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. We Me do it too. again in the future. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.